All right, if you stand and take, uh, take your Bibles, I'm going to go in the Word of God to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7. This is the second message we're getting into here in Joshua chapter 7. And we went to verse 20 last time, so if you'll go back there, we'll just use this as a springboard here for the, uh, for the chapter that we're looking at, the part of the chapter here we're looking at, or the whole chapter. Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, the Bible says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And we took the phrase out of verse 20 that says, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Now, obviously, we understand that the Lord God of Israel is the Lord God of us, of the church, uh, the God that never changes. He always was, always will be. And, uh, and so he's, if you know the Lord today, yes, he is your Lord God as well. And I'm uh, thankful for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you that we get to look in it. We're not looking for it. We're not confused. Uh, Lord, we, but we sure want you to enlighten us and to illumine our minds that we might understand what your word says. And, uh, and with this uh, issue tonight and what we're talking about with this sin of Achan and how he actually got to this point, I pray you would help us to take note of that in our own lives because this is the battle we face every day. I know for myself it's every day, every hour, um, the same things over and over and over. And I pray you'd help us tonight with this, that we'd make this application by faith, and you'd help us to move forward with our lives the way you desire for us to in victory. And we pray you guide us in this tonight, for that you might be honored and glorified through our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, and we, we talked about last time that in Genesis 15, 18 through 21, uh, how, how we saw that the Lord promised Israel a land, and uh, he keeps his promises. He also promised to give them victory, and, and he'd give them victory. But here, um, they didn't have victory. This was, uh, this was uh, one, of the, one, if not the first defeat here that they had after coming, uh, coming over uh, Jordan and, and all the things that they did and uh, d defeating uh, of Jericho here, uh, what we find. But we also equated this with, with the promise that the Lord gave us in Matthew chapter 16. So in Matthew chapter 16, we find in verse 18 that it says, And I say also unto thee, this is Jesus speaking, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and this is the promise, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so all of the, all of the powers of hell will not prevail against God's church. Now this is God's true church. This is the church in which he lives in, and these are the people um, local churches, but the body of Christ as a whole, as we go forth and, and we give the gospel and we take a stand for the Lord and we preach um, and we go to the gates of hell and we have compassion and we're snatching people out of there with the gospel, um, they will not prevail against us. And, uh, and that's a promise. And uh, we will always be victorious no matter how much the devil flaunts his strength. Now this is if we're walking with the Lord. This is His promise to the church. Now, if we want to do it on our own, and we want to go out in the flesh, and we want to try to battle Satan in the flesh, you're going to lose, and I'm going to lose. And uh, I assure you, there's nothing wrong with the Lord's promises to Israel, and there's nothing wrong with His promises to the church. Um, they're all there for us, uh, for the church, and uh, we, can, we can rest fully and be assured that He will keep His promises. Now, to discover... Our problem, because Israel had a problem, and that's why they had to defeat there, but to discover our problem, we must look at ourselves through the mirror of the Word of God. And in the Word of God, as we're looking at it, as we're considering Israel here in the Word of God and how this defeat come about in their life, we can discover what it is about them that hindered the Lord from fulfilling His promises to them and why they experienced this defeat. And then, perhaps... In discovering this about Israel, which we've been looking at, we'll discover something about us and uh, what's hindering us or, or uh, about us is hindering the Lord from fulfilling his promises to us, meaning the gates of hell not prevailing against us. We're having victory over the flesh. 
uh, we're able to live in victory in our life uh, there and have the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Now, before we take a look at this passage again, I want to remind you of what's taking place here historically and in the context uh, that we find it. Israel has miraculously uh, crossed the Jordan on dry ground and they entered into the promised land and it's called the promised land because God made a promise to them and he kept the promise and they went in by faith. They had a victory there and it was miraculously crossed over. Now, in Joshua 6, which is right before Joshua 7, we find that uh, Israel also had something else miraculous happen, and they conquered the mighty city of Jericho, which in and of themselves they should not have conquered. And they had all these things going for them, victory after victory, and the things that were happening. And then we come to chapter 7, and uh, we find actually at the end of chapter 6 um, is when it was happening, but Achan took, took uh, the forbidden uh, things here, and he hid them, and he sinned, and uh, that's what we find here, and that's what we've been talking about because he come out and confessed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And we found out that hidden sin in verse number 1 is never hidden from the Lord. You can do a good job of hiding it from me. I can do a good job of hiding it from you. But the Lord never misses sin. He always sees it. And then uh, in verses 2 through 9 is where we talked about last week about hidden sin always brings defeat. It never brings victory. The devil tells us it brings something good to us, but it never does. Hidden sin always brings defeat, and we said defeat is like an alarm that should make us aware that something is wrong. If you're having defeat in your life, and you know where your weaknesses are, and you know if you're having defeat there, that should be an alarm to you. Wake up. Wake up. You need, to, you need the Lord. You need His help in your life. Something's going on. And uh, we talked about how hidden sin brought physical defeat to them. Hidden sin brought emotional defeat to them in verse 5. And then uh, hidden sin also brought spiritual defeat in verses 6 through 9 uh, to them. So all around we're just defeated when we have hidden sin in our life. Or outward sin, but of course now we're talking about this hidden sin. And now go to verse 21 with me. We'll skip over and look back here. And he just made this confession that I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and thus and thus have I done. Now in verse 21, the Bible says this because he's going to go on and explain what he sinned. He said, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So hidden sin is never hidden to the Lord. Hidden sin always brings defeat. And here we find hidden sin and its process. Hidden sin and its process. And there's always a process to sin. It does not just happen all of a sudden. There is a process that takes place. And I want we're going to look at a, a few passages of Scripture, but we're going to go back to James chapter 1. We're going to look here at Joshua 7. We're going to mix in a little bit of Genesis chapter 3 with it. And we're going to look at some of these things and find out this process of sin. So if you'll go to James 1, that's where we'll be predominantly as we're talking about what is taking place here with Achan in his life that we need to take note of. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Let's just read 13 to 15. And the Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the process. That's what was taking place there in Achan's life. And, uh, and so we go and, and we try to examine this. In verse 13, though, let's go back to verse 13, and the Bible says here, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And so the word tempted here in the phrase, um, his own lust that we find in verse 14, tempted in his own lust there, are referring to the inner enticement to evil. The inner enticement to evil. 
This is our own desire that we're talking about here. We understand the desire, or we must understand the desire of temptation. This is our desire that we have in us, this own lust here. And the Word of God does not say if we are tempted, but when we are tempted. So it's not a question. Please understand, it's not a question if you will be tempted tonight. It's not a question if you will be tempted tomorrow if the Lord wills that you wake up and He doesn't come back. It's not a question. It's when you are tempted. When the temptation is coming. When that temptation is going to work on that inner desire that you have in your life, in our sin nature. Why do we go out seeking temptations when the Bible teaches that they just come to us? But you know you're in a bad place when you're out seeking sin. Because it's already coming to you. You don't have to go anywhere to find it. Lust simply means this. When we're talking about this word, his own lust here, it means desire. Our natural God-given desires are not sinful in and of themselves. They're all right. God gave them to us. Now we do have other desires that are of the sin, sin nature. But talking about the need to eat. Okay, we get hungry. Getting hungry is not a sin. Okay, I have a need to drink. If I don't drink something liquid and I don't drink it and get that in my body and I'm, and I'm thirsty, then I'm going to die very shortly. I'm not going to live very long. That's just a natural desire. Now, outside of God's will, if I eat and keep eating, not just because I'm hungry but because I want to eat, and if I'm drinking and I'm not just drinking because I need to drink but I want to drink and... It could be anything, but obviously not alcoholic beverages, but I'm talking about if we're drinking water or something for hydration. You become a glutton. You know, I can sit down and drink a gallon of sweet tea and I'd be a glutton. Okay? Sorry, some of you. Uh, but you could be a glutton. I mean, that's not good for you to drink a gallon of anything all at one time. Or if you eat and you eat and you eat just ate five times as much as anybody else sitting at the dinner table, and now you feel sick and you can't move, you are a glutton. God didn't make us to eat that much, but he gave you an ap ad appetite because you do need to eat. It does need to make energy. So these are natural lusts or desires that we have in our body that are good, but outside of God's will, it becomes bad. Hey, I need rest. You need rest. We get tired. Outside of God's will, if you rest too much, you become lazy. I mean, just outside of God's will. So we, with, with the way God made men and women is that we have a physical desire for the opposite sex. You couldn't tell that today, with all the talk going on, but that is how it works, and that is how God made us, um, or the human race could not continue to go on if that was not the case. Now, we have that naturally, and nothing is wrong with that naturally, but outside of God's will, which is within the bonds of marriage, that this be fulfilled, outside of that, it becomes fornication and it becomes adultery. And that is every sexual sin that you can find falls into fornication and adultery. Anything. So I'm not picking on one thing. I'm picking on everything because God does. And it's not right. So when you get outside of God's will with that desire, innate desire that he gave us to procreate and have more children and to replenish the earth, then it becomes a sin. But these are natural desires that we have. Now, faith in God does not exempt us from temptations but it does enable us to have victory over the temptations that come our way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, the Bible says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So our desires must be our servants, not our masters. When your desire, God-given desire, becomes your master, then it's got control of you. And it's going to become sin in your life, whatever that might be. Achan, back in Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, the Bible says, when I saw. When I saw. He looked, he looked at it. So Achan saw or looked, and he was tempted by his desire to have. He wanted it. It all starts with a look. 
If Satan can get us to look, or really what it's talking about is to gaze. Not just a, just a brief look at something, but a, a gaze. You stare upon it. If he can get you to do that with the temptation, then we are headed in the wrong direction. And Achan knew what he was not supposed to be doing, but he looked at it anyway. And he kept looking at it, and he kept thinking about that silver and that gold and that garment. And he thought, I'm, I'm going to look at it anyway. I'm not supposed to. I'm going to look at it anyway. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. You'll find, you'll find in Genesis chapter 3, and you'll know the story here of the fall of man, and uh, Adam and Eve. And Eve here, let's just read verse 6, and you'll see something here right away. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve desired the fruit. She took the fruit, and she sinned by eating the fruit. That's what took place. Now, most people try to place the blame somewhere else besides themselves for their sin. And obviously, we see that here. People say, well, it's not my fault. I can't help it. <laughs> I just committed the sin. Maybe it's, you know, if I grew up in a different society, if I grew up way back in the 1800s, I wouldn't have this issue. It's just because of the time I grew up. It's my circumstances. You know, I just got some really bad circumstances in life. And because I got these bad circumstances, that means I really can't control myself. And I'm okay. I'm okay. God's going to see me as being okay, even though he said it wasn't. He sees me as being okay. I'm going to justify this. Someone else made me do this. I mean, these are all excuses of our day. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves making these same excuses. And Adam and Eve did the same thing. You remember, God came to them and they were hiding. And he said, well, who told you you were naked? Well, they started off. Well, Adam says, well, the woman you gave me, God, she gave it to me and I ate it. <laughs> she said, well, the serpent beguiled me. <laughs> it was none of their fault. It was always somebody else's fault. And we got to be careful about that because she would have never had the desire if she would have never saw it, if she wouldn't have started, kept looking at it. And she knew, God said, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there. And so they were in a perfect environment. The environment didn't, uh, did not make them sin. They chose to sin. She should have never looked. So the blame for our sin and misconduct always falls back on us. We cannot point the finger at another person. It's always back on you, and it's always back on me. Look at First, our, uh, yeah, First John, chapter two. First John, chapter two. The Bible says here, verse fifteen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we see here how Satan's world system works on our desires to tempt us. This is how he's working. We could refer to this as the three satanic traps that he has for us. And the Bible says it like this in verse 16. The lust of the flesh, this is the desire to do something. Our flesh has a desire for something and we want to do it. Then the Bible says that there's a lust of the eyes. This is the desire to have something. You look at it, you see it, you want it, you want to have it. Then the Bible says it's the pride of life. And that's the desire to be something. You want to do something, you want to have something, you want to be something. This is how the devil trips us up. Our besetting sin, any sin is going to fall into one of these categories. It always does. And he's got a system set up, the devil, to trip us up here. Now, when we went to, when you go to Genesis 13, 
we find the story here of Lot. And we come to verse 10, and the Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld. The Bible could have, you know, or it is saying that he saw. Right? He saw something. He lifted up his eyes and he beheld it. He looked on it. He gazed on it. That's what he's doing. He beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. And Lot chose him of all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And so Lot beheld Sodom and Gomorrah. He saw it, he looked that way, and he chose or he took Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the Bible teaches us that he sinned by living with them in their sin. But if he'd have never looked and gazed on that way and saw that he wanted that because why? The lust of his eyes. I can go over there. I can have all that stuff. I can do stuff over there. I can be somebody over there. Abram's not going to be with me. He saw it. He went the wrong way. The process of what he determined to do is because of what he saw. Then we come to 2 Samuel, and we think about the story of David, which is... A, all these stories are tragic stories, but David, David here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we come to verse 2, and the Bible says, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David rose up from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. What, how did, what happened? He saw. He saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliashim, or Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and, take, to, and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned into her house, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. David looked at Bathsheba. Then he took Bathsheba. And then he sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba. And then he tried to hide it by saying, Uriah, come back off the field. And he could get him drunk. You can go be with your wife. Nobody will ever know because they'll just think it was when you come back. But you know what? That didn't work out because he was loyal to the king. It's a great testimony there, by the way. But he was loyal to the king. He said, I'm not going to go over there. All my other fellow soldiers are on the field. My, uh, my general's on the field. I'm not going to do that. Never did. So he sent a death, th death note back with him, put him on the front lines, and he did. And he killed him. He didn't just kill Uriah. You know there was other soldiers that died in that battle too because of that decision? Multiple families were affected by that. Multiple deaths happened because of that. All these things. Now, now we get back to Achan. These are some bad things that were going on. But all of it, we saw, took place... When they looked and they gazed at what they were not supposed to have. And, the, and Satan makes it so good. And he'll sideswipe you at the most inopportune time. And you'll gaze. And you'll look. And Achan's temptation was the lust of his eyes. And his desire was to have those spoils of war that he saw there. I know I'm not supposed to have those. I could do a lot with that gold, with that silver. Those are very nice garments. So we must understand the desire of temptation. It's there. You have it. I have it. Everybody has it. Everybody has the desire and the temptation. Now, back in James chapter 1, in verse 14, the Bible says, When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So we understand, we must understand the design of temptation. Not only that we have a desire of the temptation, but the design of it. How is it designed? To draw away of his own lust and enticed. 
Temptation is designed to draw us away from the Lord. We're drawn away from something, is what the Bible says. Well, you've got to be, as a believer, you've got to be drawn away from the Lord. It's what it's getting. It's getting your eyes off the Lord onto something else. And draw away means to be forcibly compelled. We are being tempted and drawn away at the same time. Same time. Tempted and drawn away. That's the only way the temptation works is to forcibly compel us to look away from the Lord in faith and fall for the temptation. The temptation is designed to entice us to evil. That's what it says, drawn away and enticed. Enticed is referring to a temptation from outside of us. Earlier, we were talking about temp being tempted and by his own lust. This was the enticement of evil in us from our sin nature. But now he's saying that he's drawn away and enticed. He's enticed from some outward thing that's trying to draw you away from the Lord, whether it be with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. It's drawing you away from the Lord to fall for it. Entice means to be beguiled by allurements and deceitful rep, uh, representations. The power of sin, the power of sin could never prevail if it were not for its cunning deception. Could never do it. If you go fishing, unless you're a good fisherman, the fish aren't dumb. You've got to be cunning. If you're going to go hunt, those animals aren't dumb. You've got to be cunning. You've got to do certain things. You've got to trick them. Um, it's just the way it happens. Uh, and so your enticement, this power of sin, it would have no power over us because of our victory in Jesus if it didn't turn us away from Him and entice us to come to it. Enticement is the method of Satan used to blind the minds of the lost so they don't come to Christ and receive Him, and also to trap the saved from yielding to the Lord's will in their life. This is what He's doing to us, but He's also working in the lost too. The deception is that, is that it appeals to our natural desires, but does not show us the end, which is the sorrow and the punishment of it, but it's something that we naturally want. For example, David committing adultery with Bathsheba. He only saw the deceptive appeal to it. He looked, it's a beautiful woman, that should have been it. Accidentally, I saw that. I'm moving on. But, it, but his natural desires led him down the wrong path. He didn't realize, he didn't see, he didn't see the end of that. He didn't see the tragic consequences. He didn't see the murder of Uriah and all the other men that died in the battle that day when they went forward. He didn't see that. He didn't see the death of his baby son that was going to come out of that um, adultery uh, relationship that broke his heart. He didn't see the violation of his daughter Tamar by her brother Amnon. He didn't see that coming. He didn't see his son Absalom being killed or, or killing his brother Amnon for what he did to Tamar. He didn't see Absalom revolting against him and trying to take the kingdom, which went, ended up in Absalom's death, which broke David's heart again. He didn't see that. But all of this breaking of his heart was because he broke God's heart. What he did, he paid fourfold for it, just like he wanted to dish out when Nathan came to him. And he said, thou art the man. You're the man that did this. He didn't see the end. If he saw the end, he would have never done it. I don't think he would have done it. And if we could take what I would call the long look, but we don't because we get enticed and we don't take the long look and we commit sin anyway. But if we could take the long look and say, this is appealing to the lust of my flesh, the lust of my eyes, the pride of life, but... Down the road, what is this going to cost me? If we just stop a second, keep our eyes on the Lord, and say, Lord, what is this going to cost me? I know you don't want me to do this, so I don't need to do that. We could have victory. We could have victory in our life. You know, just like this temptation and sinning 
has these two parts about being drawn away and enticed. Holiness consists of two parts too. To be holy, we must forsake that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Same idea. For we have to forsake the Lord and to cleave unto evil in order to sin, but you have to forsake evil and cleave unto that which is good, which is the Lord, to live holy. As holiness consists of two parts, there are two parts of this sin. We're drawn away from that which is good and we're enticed to cleave to that which is evil. Our heart is enticed to do that. This is the process. Now, we also must understand the devastation of temptation. Back in James chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says this, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the Bible says, Then when lust hath conceived. All right, we've already been enticed. We've already been drawn away and enticed to sin. Our lust has already turned. We've turned our, our eye of faith off. We've now worked in sight. We saw something we wanted, whether it be the desire to do, have, or be something. We've seen it. Now we've turned to it. And the Bible says, then when lust hath conceived. That's when it conceived. When we were drawn away, it's conceived. It's conceived. We're already going that way. Lust uh, so we see the conception of lust here. And lust is not sin, but when it's yielded to, it produces or gives birth to sin. Conception, it was something that's put together or when something comes together. Of course, we think about a baby when we think about conception. We believe life begins at conception. Right when the seed and the, and the, uh, the egg are meet together at conception, that is life. And right here, when you're drawn away and enticed, that's when it's brought together. And that conception is taking place here. Conception takes place when we yield to the proposition of sin. And Achan coveted or lusted after the things that he looked at. In verse 21, he said, once he saw them, then he said, I coveted them. And the Bible tells us, that obviously in the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, 17, thou shalt not covet. He saw it. Then he coveted after it. And then we find it says that this, that it bringeth forth sin. When it is conceived, then it bringeth forth sin. Or it bringeth forth sin. So the birth of sin, the conception of our lust, brings the birth of sin in our life. And before a person ever sins, the sin had a beginning. It's always conceived somewhere. And most of the time it's conceived right in our mental faculties of our mind and how we think about something, and we're not being renewed in our minds, so we let it entice us away and get us. Sin works on our soul. It works on our emotions, our intellect, our will, our emotionally because we have desires that come out of our emotions, intellectually because it deceives us, in our will because we give in to it and we do it in our life. And sin wrecks havoc on us and we should not function off our emotions, but off of our will. Children operate on emotions. But we shouldn't be like children. We should be like adults and operate off of our will. We determined to do something in our life. Now, Achan took the items that he lusted after and he carried them out and carried out the sin of his heart. He saw them, he coveted them, and then he did something. He took them. He took them. The actual committing of the sin. Physically committing. And then we find the final product of death that comes out of it. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Lust, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The final product of sin is death. Finished means to complete entirely. So not, not just when something starts coming together in conception... But now it's already matured, and now it's actually complete. The sin is complete. And Achan hid the items that he took. He said he hid them. He knew it was wrong, and he hid them. And sin, born in lust, gives birth to death. When sin is completed, it brings death to the soul of man. And we need the Lord's help. We need the Lord's help. Death came to Israel... The Lord's presence and power was gone. Thirty-six soldiers died. Achan and his family died. So a lot went on there. 
with Achan. Because he saw it, he coveted it, he took it, and he hid it. Sin cannot produce life. Only death. At conception, that's all it's producing is death. And then when it's finished, that's what comes out of it. In the unbeliever, sin produces death of their soul on earth and eventually in the lake of fire. In the believer, sin produces death to the soul that will rob us of intimate fellowship with the Lord. Not of your relationship, but it will rob you of your fellowship with the Lord because you will not be able to function the way the Lord wants you to function. You will not be able to think the way that you ought to be thinking when you are being drawn away and enticed and when you let that conceive and then it gives forth to sin and then sin's going to bring forth death in your life. And when we as believers get further away from the Lord, all the blessings of the Lord, they're not fresh in our lives anymore. Have you been there before? They're not just not fresh anymore. You start thinking things. Well, where's the peace at that I'm supposed to have? Well, it's because you've been... You've been uh, making the wrong decisions. You've been drawn away. You've been conceiving some things in your heart, and now it's come forth in sin. Now it's bringing forth death, and there's a death or a separation in your fellowship with God. Where's my joy that Jesus promised me? I don't think there's any problem with the Holy Spirit, with His fruit. I don't think there's any problem with Him giving us victory. The problem is on our part. Where's the fulfillment in my life I'm supposed to have? Where's my security of my salvation? Why am I doubting my salvation? Well, maybe if you didn't let sin be conceived and bringing forth death, maybe you wouldn't have those thoughts in your life. That maybe I'm not saved. Where's the holiness in my life? Where's the comfort? Because God is, God is the God of all comfort. Where's that at? Where's my Christ-like attitude that I once had? It's all been put down because you're letting sin bring forth death in your life. And you have no more intimate relationship or intimate fellowship within your relationship with Christ. It didn't get there in, with one thing. It didn't get there with one thing. It's been a process. Just like sin is a process, you get to a point by a process. But as sin grows in our mind and, and it matures, it, it turns from a desire into an action. And this sinful action turns into a repeated habit or a way of life. And we find that sometimes, unbeknownst to us, sometimes we understand what's going on, but something becomes a habit in our life because we give consent to it. And when by degrees our sins carry us far out of fellowship with the Lord, and the sin which deceived us will become our destroyer. But it never started out that way. It never told you, I'm going to destroy you. Right? Come and drink some alcohol, I'm going to destroy you. Come and have this relationship you're not supposed to be having. I'm going to destroy you. Come take this prescription medicine or these illegal drugs, I'm going to destroy you. It doesn't say that. The commercials don't say that. The people that the devil uses to entice you, it doesn't say that. But that's what's happening. The end of it is destruction. But how do we stop this process that's taking place? By faith, we use the Word of God. We have victory through God's Word. That's why we need to be in it. That's why I told you this past year, don't get out of the Word of God. We need to get more in the Word of God than ever because we're going to need it. There's a lot of people that did not, that claim to be Christians, and they're acting just like the world with everything that's going on that we've been experiencing for the past 15 or 16 months. They're in lockstep with the world because they don't understand what's going on. They're being deceived. Now, Jesus used Scripture, and he faced the devil's temptation. If you want to go there, it's Matthew 4, 1 through 11. I'm not going to take time to read it tonight. 
But you understand, when he was tempted of the devil, the devil tempted him and he said, it's written. Tempted him, he said, it's written. He quoted him scriptures. Tempted him, it's written. He brought him some scriptures. We're not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We use the word of God to have victory. We let the word of God draw us away from the enticement. That's the only way we're going to have victory is to go this way when the sin is this way. We get drawn away this way and we cleave to that which is good and we turn away from that which is evil and we need the word of God. It's clarity. You don't need somebody else telling you what to do. You need the word of God. You need a conviction about what you find in the word of God that he can help you. You have a promise you have everything that God has for you in, in His Word, and you believe it. We use the Word of God by faith. And by faith, we also take our temptations to Jesus. We can have victory through the Lord's presence. We have victory through the Word of God, and we have victory through the presence of God. When we don't have victory, you weren't meditating on Scriptures, and you weren't in God's presence. Every time. When I don't have victory, same thing. That's what's taking place in our lives. And we need this. Jesus has made a way for us to escape. Look at 1 Corinthians here. We'll end with this verse. Our verse says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First, Corinthians chapter 10. I want to get down to verse 13. But in verse 5, the Bible says, But with many... But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them, for examples, and, and, the, uh, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. There are examples, there are admonition. These examples that we see here from, from Israel. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. That means don't think you can stand. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Meaning, it's going to be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. It's common. Everybody's going to have the same temptation you have in some form or way. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. He's made a way to escape. He did not say he made a way to escape from your sin. He said that you may be able to bear it. You escape with that temptation. You escape to him. The way of escape is to him. You come to him with the temptation. You go to him and you gaze upon him, not the temptation, but you're able to bear it because he's going to help you to bear it. He's made a way for you. You are tempted like I'm tempted. And if we think we can stand, we're going to fall. But if we can escape to him with it, he's more than able. He's more than able to keep us. He's more than able to help us. We need his very presence. We need to escape into his presence. And we need his word to help us. We must not forget that the source of our temptation is our own lust. The design of temptation is to draw us away from the Lord. And the devastation that it causes is separation from the Lord. We must come clean with the Lord about our sin and get out of the cycle of being defeated. That was never the cycle God wanted you to be in. It's never the cycle he wanted Israel to be in. It can happen, but it's not the cycle. Father, please help us at this very moment. Whatever you put on our hearts, whatever you spoke to us about, may we be careful to yield it to you at this very moment. 
We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you need to come to the altar. I encourage you to do so as quickly as possible to talk to the Lord. Maybe you're here and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost tonight. I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm always yielding to my temptations. I have no, I have no evidence, and I don't think that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe that's you tonight, and maybe you need to be saved. Anybody raise their hand and say, that's me. I don't know if I die tonight, I'm going to heaven. I seriously doubt it, and I'm concerned about that. Anybody like that tonight? Okay, believers. What temptation is drawing you away from the Lord? You have one. Everybody has one. We call them besetting sin. The sin that so easily besets you. Maybe you're looking at it. Maybe you're lusting after it. Maybe you're carrying it out. Maybe you're even hiding it like Achan did. Is there a hidden sin in your home? Is it something your family is aware of? Will you confess that sin and get victory from the Lord before he has to expose it? You know how embarrassing that was for Achan? When he thought he had it hid from everybody, but God knew about it? And God exposed it? And had to deal with his family? God does deal with sin. I don't think he's waiting to drop a hammer on your head. I think he's waiting with open arms for you to come to him. But he does take care of sin. He will chasten his children. And we need to be aware that it's coming, the temptation. We can escape to him. We can find the strength we need through his word. We can find the promises that we need. We need to pray for each other, help each other, encourage each other. The world sure isn't going to do it. Father, thank you. Thank you again for your word. Very troubling story in your word. Several of the stories we looked at. But the way it ends, him and his family dying because of this sin. He knew what to do and he didn't do it. And we think about back to the garden. Lord, we, we all died in Adam. Because of that sin. But I'm so thankful that your son died, was buried and rose from the dead for us, that we are all made alive in Christ. Thank you for that. You're so good to us. Not only did you pay for all of our sin to give us eternal life, and then you did give it to us when we accepted your son as our savior by faith. When we believed on him and received him. But you also give us victory in this life now. You've given us freedom from sin. And you give us a way to escape. That we can come to you with it. That you will help us to bear our burdens. The burden of these temptations that weigh upon us daily. We just want to live clean. We just want to live pure. But we understand until we're done with this sinful flesh, it's always going to be there, and the desires are innate, and they're there, and they're, they're trying to, to get out. Help us to put this flesh to death and find the victory that you desire for us. As individuals, as families, as a church family, Lord, please help us. Help us to seal these things in our hearts that you've spoken to us about. Help us to close the door in our life to this sin that... Maybe just a besetting sin in our life, and it's just hard for us to get over it. Help us not to be enticed and drawn away from you with it. Help us to recognize the process. Help us to move forward in complete victory, Lord. Well, thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.